everybody, and welcome to The Big Picture with Amazing Dyslexics. My name is Gil Gershoni, and I'm the founder and creative director of Gershoni Creative Agency and Dyslexia Design Thinking. I'm a dyslexic. Happy Dyslexic Awareness Week in the UK and Dyslexia Awareness Month in the US. We're here today to celebrate the gift of dyslexia. When I was a young boy, reading and writing was really difficult for me. I can see through the letters and above the letters and below the letters all at the same time. As I got older, I realized that seeing through things, seeing above things, seeing below things was not uh, a disability. It was actually a hyperability. I'm so excited to share with you today some amazing dyslexic from this brand new book, the big picture book of amazing dyslexic and your job they do. I'm looking forward to hearing some of their stories about how they overcame their disabilities and turned them into hyper abilities. One of these amazing dyslexic is my co-host and friend, Abe Rogers. Welcome, Abe. Hi, hi, Jill. Thanks so much for for uh, for uh, opening up to, to us. So we're very excited today to be to be going through these fantastic biographies and seeing how all these people um, have, are working in celebration of of, of dyslexia, um, and certainly not as a disability, but an ability. Um, I think we need to you know this is it's about learning differences as as, uh, as um, new ways of of seeing and and, and thinking. And, and really gaining passion from, from the differences. I think far much, too much of the world is polarized into these very parallel lines. And we need to find ways to break free and to encourage the educational system to, to, to break free and allow us to be the creative individuals that we are rather than to fit into to, to other boxes. Um, you know, if I were to describe dyslexia in one sentence, I suppose, it has given me the ability to see things that are not there. It is the ability mm. to sit in my head and to, to visualize smells, to visualize the texture of, of colors that I'm imagining. I, I, I think the, the interesting um, thing is that we only know our own normal. So when people say that I see things different, I think they see things different. When people spell words to me, I think, how can you honestly come up with that as a solution. It seems to make no sense to put those strange letters together in that order. And how is everyone supposed to know how all these orders come together? But then there are many things which we understand that others don't. I love that, I love that. Abe, what are you looking for uh, for the audience to hear today as we talk to some more amazing dyslexic? What are you looking forward to? I am looking forward into all the different um, idiots, all the different normals. I think normals become mm. such a dangerous word post COVID, so maybe we shouldn't use normal. But all the different perceptions of how people are processing information, how they visualize. You know, I certainly should not be a surgeon. I would, would really get things confused and believe <laughs> things inside the body. So I'm really interested to see how the surgeon works. I'm also quite interested mm. to see how you work as a medician, because I'd also be a really hopeless medician and would definitely saw people in half and leave them in cupboards and, and put them in, in, in different places. So I think what's so interesting is how individual we all are, which is maybe why we talk about the spectrum or the kind That's of right. neurodiversity rather yeah. than this singular label of, of dyslexia. Yeah, I love that. As, as all of you out there are joining us today and listening to some of these amazing takeaways, please use the hashtag amazing dyslexic and share and spread the word and, uh, Follow us and um, you know uh, bring bring the world, bring the dyslexia world together. Um, you know, Abe, I think that uh, if it wasn't for uh, Kate and Kathy, the author of the new book, I think that you and I would have never met, and some of these amazing things that would never come together. So let's uh, let's bring Kate and Kathy on screens and uh, welcome them to the show. Hi, hello. hi guys, how's it going? Um, slightly out of our comfort zone, we're usually at the kitchen table um, doing our book stuff. 
Um, so for those of you that don't know us, um, this is Cathy Hi. and I'm Kate and we've written two books about amazing dyslexics. Da -da -da. And in normal circumstances we would be at a book launch and um, be celebrating with all the people in the book um, and unfortunately we can't be doing that. But what Gil has lovely, uh, generously provided us to do is give us this platform to be able to share um, all the positive messages we want to share about dyslexia. Gil, we really appreciate that. It's um, We are able to spread the word a lot further and wider now, thanks to you. Um, but one day we will have a book launch and Gil will come from San Francisco and we'll join Yay. And, glasses. and we'll have a colourful character's book launch party for sure definitely i can't wait i can't wait so having worked for a long time in the creative industries kathy and i are very used to amazing dyslexics and their beautiful minds um but we do know that um for our children going through the school education system it became um, a bit of a, a you know we know how tough it is so we knew that we had to try and inspire them and show them um, these amazing dyslexics and what they could achieve. Um, and what um, we did with the book was really beautifully summed up by Julian Ogawara, who's a, an architect featured. And we love this because he says, I feel like you brought together an amazing bunch of lost friends with very <laughs> similar experiences, struggles and superpowers. This really will inspire young people. That's wonderful. Um, and I definitely Beautiful. feel like I'm, I'm um, involved with all these people that I haven't met, but I do feel part of a friendship group just because we have so many things in common. But um, why are we here and why did we write the book? So we are here to change the connotation of the word dyslexia, because as we know, people still associate that word with lots of negative stuff. And we know dyslexia brings a load of positive stuff um we've met some incredible people while we've gone through and interviewed people from the book and they're all clever and charming and um they're at the top of their game they're doing things because they found their passion early and were able to channel that passion and that creativity and whatever they do and found a career and that's what we're saying to all teenage teenagers out there and I, I hope some teenagers are out there watching because um, it's for you guys. It's We're trying to spread that message of find your passion and find a career because you will fly. You really will. Yeah. Um, the other um, bit in the book that we wanted to mention was the fact that dyslexia is very different for everyone. And to be your best self, you really need to understand what your challenges and strengths are as a dyslexic. Um, the wonderful Paul Smith, who wrote our foreword, said, major on the things you are good at. Um, in the book, we also have a section um, that uh, introduces lots of um, organisations and experts in the field of dyslexia. And we love things like John Stein, who's a professor at Oxford University. He says that he wouldn't want to cure dyslexia because it comes with too many good things. Mm. Um, so after meeting all these amazing people, um, interviewing them for the book, uh, and they were amazing, they just poured out their hearts, they were very honest about their dyslexia, they told the truth, and we felt that we had to design a book to do these stories justice. So with that in mind, we, we did three things. We, um, it, we felt it was important to photograph the amazing dyslexic in their working environment to show uh, or to give an essence of where um, if you're a designer what a studio looks like if you were a choreographer what what a, what a, what a ballet oh, studio yeah. looks like um, so that was important and two we structured the book on first alpha first name we thought that would be um, more friendly um, you know surnames tend to be a bit more complicated we didn't want any of that sounding out we wanted like to be friendly <laughs> and and just you know a gill they're fantastic names for dyslexics too um, yeah. yeah and then of course and that also meant the um, approach of uh, randomly positioning careers 
um, in the book, so it kind of gave it a spontaneity. So a, a choreographer would be next to a high court judge and a Times journalist and, and a Times journalist and stuff like that. And then um, three, uh, we use the dyslexic favorite color as a graphic tool to help people navigate through the book. So at the beginning of the book. Um, all these colour swatches are laid out and that becomes your content page. There are no page numbers. We, we found it that this was a visual way of communicating. If you wanted to find somebody, you looked at their colour, you looked at their number, and then you could quickly find their page. Um, and then more importantly, this takes us to the last page of the book, which is a very important message. And it is, um, love what you do and work together. And, uh, and collaboration, collaboration is, key. is key. And Kate and I work brilliantly together because Kate has strengths that I don't, and, uh, and vice versa. And vice versa. <laughs> so that is a very that, that is a very dislike like thing, right? For us to sort of partner with uh, our our colleagues and friends and community to support our strengths and differences. And I love the way the two of you just you know, work together and finish each other's sentences and have this, you know, it, vision that comes to life and brings so much energy, so much excitement to to everything you do. Um, I would love, first of all, the book, the book is so gorgeous and the way as a dyslexic to be able to read it as you described in so many different ways uh, is absolutely brilliant. Let's bring some of these amazing dyslexics so we can uh, hear a little bit from them as well. So, um, so, I, you I know, said, I'm, I'm not with you in the same room because we would clash so well between the between the, the pink um, and the and the orange thing together. With your yeah, also the red fun. ring, I think we could have a little royal, colourful, colourful right. clash. It's there, royal you know, conversations. But for me, the biggest problem with with dyslexia is the bloody spelling of the word, and what a ridiculous word to to summarise um, issues around 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 letters. And we really need a, a new word for it. Which I think maybe Helen could possibly find us being a very wordy um, person amongst us. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, no, no, great to see your faces. Great to see your faces. I, um, you know, I would like to go around and have everybody introduce themselves and maybe in a word or a sentence tell us what is dyslexia means to you. Um, Charlotte, let's start with you. Yeah. Hi. I'm. Charlotte. Um, I'm a choreographer, filmmaker, um, and dancer. I started my career at the Royal Ballet and then I went freelance and since then I've worked with some amazing companies like the Bayer Stats Ballet, Dutch National Ballet, uh, Norwegian National Ballet, and more recently I've co-founded a company with Elizabeth Arifian called Move Beyond Words, which is here to amplify the voices of dyslexic artists. Um, and I was thinking about what, um, what is dyslexia to me? And it's a very multifaceted thing. It is to me a Rubik's cube where you're constantly trying to solve something and constantly shifting um, to ch try and find this combination. I feel like People are trying to strive to find this uniform pattern, but within trying to solve this Rubik's cube, there's a beauty with the colors and the shapes. And actually what's great is you might find something brilliant before getting to the end result. And that to me, I think is what dyslexia is. Oh, beautiful. and I will pass this to Helen. <laughs> I just remembered. I had to pass this over to Helen. Hey, hey so um, I'm Helen Taylor. I uh, do research on dyslexia and the evolution of this form of cognition, and um, I've developed some new theory from the evolution from that. And um, so, my you know, the way I think about dyslexia is, I guess, on the one hand, it feels like um, it feels like this huge misunderstanding of what's a really important way of thinking, and then on the other hand, this way of thinking to me is um, well, and what my research shows is. is it's a specialization in exploration and discovery and invention. And it's really integral to how our species evolves. So um, yeah, so to me, it's a really important way of thinking that I think we need to, to nurture. And uh, yeah, I pass over to James. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. 
Hey, James. Uh, hey, Gil. Thank you so much for having us, guys. I've got to say that I've done probably about 1,304,000 webinars since COVID began. And this is the most glamorous by a long way. And I'm really, this is my favorite one, definitely. So, so my name's James, I'm a surgeon and I'm a scientist and I run a research group at Imperial College in London. And we play with robots and computers and gut bacteria and a whole bunch of stuff. Um, for me, dyslexia, I'm gonna borrow a word from my um, eight-year-old nephew called Atticus, and he has he has this amazing blonde fringe, and he calls it his blurs, and it's his blurs because it looks really cool, which is good, but it's bad because everybody wants to touch it, and you can't see where you're going. So it's a blessing and it's a curse. So when I was little, dyslexia was definitely a curse. It was this deeply frustrating thing. And then as I've got older, it's absolutely my biggest blessing. It's given me everything in my career. And, and so I've kind of learned to, to, to love it. But sadly, I don't have a blonde fringe. So that's kind of what dyslexia means to me. And I think I've got the, the honor of introducing Lloyd. Thank you. Um, yeah, for me, uh, dyslexia definitely was a huge obstacle for myself because uh, I'm an actor, so I started off in sort of improvisation groups and then I went off to do theatre in like the West End and then I did a lot of television and now I've just moved into film and just trying to create my own stuff as well on top of that. But at the beginning, it was very difficult because obviously you're reading scripts and the way that my mind is processing the, the dialogue, I'm completely blocked. I can't learn it this way. And it went on for ages and it, it sort of brought up a lot of things. It brought up a lot of hard times and uh, depressions and stuff like that because I couldn't live my dream. I couldn't live what I knew what was inside of me and how I create and how I uh, express myself. And it was just to do with this dyslexia, not having a way to deal with it. And so it taught me a lot about my self-discovery and I did suddenly find ways to channel um, a way of learning and getting away uh, and getting and then absolutely being able to accept it and grow with it so i would say in a word it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting one but i would say yeah it takes you on a deep journey with self discovery and i would say it mirrors life in the in the way that life always throws you obstacles and it's how you respond that is going to dictate the trajectory of where you're going so um, I don't really have a can sum it up in one word, but that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so that was a, beautiful. Can you hear me? Am I? Am I? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you heard me brilliantly. I'm very correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So okay, yeah. I would sum it up and say that it's um, it, it's something to do with. I have analogies. I have analogies is what I use, to be honest. So I always talk about, um, you put like a sword, to shape a sword, you got to put it in the furnace. And, and that's what dyslexia was for me. It was like, it was something that was painful, but that was the thing that kind of shaped my, my kind of strength in a way, you know, the sword. So that's my analogy guys. But that, <laughs> beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, hi, Pip. How are you? Hi, very good. Um, yes, welcome, I'm, welcome. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, I'm talking to you from my boat, <laughs> so I'm hoping the sound's okay. Um, but yeah, my name is Pip Jameson. I'm the founder and CEO um, of The Dots, which Forbes called us the next LinkedIn. Um, so I'm a tech entrepreneur. Um, and I guess, how would I describe dyslexia? Um, it's definitely my superpower. So 35% um, of, of entrepreneurs are dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires. So I wouldn't be where I am today if I didn't have it. And is the sound okay? Because I sound like I'm underwater. <laughs> well, you you are, but you do sound perfect. You do sound perfect. Okay, very good. very jealous. It looks the wonderful. Boat hasn't sunk yet. Yeah. 
Well, you know, um, one of the things that I always uh, um, kind of try to express and think about is um, what would surprise you guys um, you know, what would surprise your younger self, I should say, uh, finding, you know, where you are today? Um, you know, is there something that you would have never thought that you would have uh, uh, got here with all the sort of challenges that we discussed? Um, Charlotte, would you like to start with that? Yeah, I think, um, I think at school, uh, going to a creative arts school, I always dreamed big and dreamed about what I wanted to achieve, um, as a career, so I feel like getting getting a position at the Royal Ballet quite early on was huge, and and something I had no idea uh, I was capable of because I felt like at school um, you're told quite often that you're not going to achieve much because you have dyslexia. So I feel that was a, a huge thing that um, that I, I I would hope my younger self would would feel surprised by um, feeling that that was something that. I may have not thought I could achieve. Beautiful. Do you James, think your, uh, go, ahead, go ahead. Do you think your dyslexia affects the way you dance as well? Do you program the dance in a different, in, in a different maze to your other colleagues? Oh yeah, no, a hundred percent. I think uh, as a choreographer, you have to put a, a huge amount of preparation in. There's one thing I really struggle with, especially in the studio, and that's counting time signatures. I really struggle, although I love music and I feel um, many of the people that I work with are very musical. Um, it's trying to articulate that and, and trying to get really complex time signatures into my body so I can teach others. But it was so on the other side as a dancer, um, retaining information, retaining sequences can be really challenging. And the more complex they get, um, the harder it is. And especially in this industry where um, you have to learn very, very quickly. There's, um, I feel like people throw something at you and you have to have an instant response and you can't have a four second delay to process it. So I think um, it's, been, it's been a huge challenge to find strategies, not only as a choreographer, but as a dancer. And I think it's, um, it's really the people that you surround yourself by and the preparation that you need to put in. So, um, yeah, I don't know if that's quite likely the answer to your question, but um, definitely challenges. But hey. I think we all get so excited about the instinctive nature of dyslexia and how fluid and how easy it is to see and to move things. But when you're trying to apply it to such a structured series of events, I, I, I can only imagine how complicated it would be. I know I would always come out at the wrong moment. And then <laughs> no. Luckily, I'm not an answer. Oh, no, no. That's no, no, that's so true. And I think that the worry is also having a blank, a blank moment on stage in anything, if you're an actor or a dancer or just under pressure. Um, I feel like in those environments, your dyslexia can be heightened, especially. Um, so, yeah, just I think the main thing is to try and create that environment as soon as earlier on in the process as possible to kind of avoid any of any of those worries. Um, if that makes any sense, if you're preparing for a performance to try and get yourself in that heated environment so that if you're under pressure and you're worried about not remembering a step, then you're sort of... Well, you're, in the, you're in a kind of zone. You create this little bubble that you, that you sit in and suddenly, hopefully, the things arrive in your head at the right place at the right time. Yeah, we hope. <laughs> I feel like... I hope. <laughs> Well, I, 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 lo I love the idea that dancing with your dyslexia is, is part of the, the flow of it and it's part of how you um, take in things and embody things. I know that Lloyd, you, when you're working on some of your scripts and you sort of uh, uh, try to remember them, mm -hmm. you draw them, you act them until you embody that information and you're able to sort of express your feelings and express your characters. Um, tell me, Lloyd, what would surprise your younger self about where you are today? Well, what would something that really stands out? You'd be like, wow, I would have never imagined I would have got you. Um, I think, I think just the probably, you know, I was born in like the eighties. So we had like channels one to five growing up. And then, so the things I used to watch on the weekend uh, one of the jobs I got was, was casualty. And that was the only thing I used to watch on the weekend with my nan. And then to probably think that I was going to 
end up on that show, <laughs> you know, fast forward 30 years later, um, is quite remarkable in the sense that that's something I watched as a child and then was in. So I would say to my younger self, would be like, yes, yeah, very kind of amazed and actually in one way when I think about it now is like yeah when I actually say those words you do definitely take it for granted that you know when you're a kid and stuff like that and you do have dreams and you do have these things and then we do them we our dreams do become so big is that we forget that actually small the smaller dreams are, are just as important as the big things and um I probably would say the my younger self looking back now was all the worries and the insecurities were actually going to be transmuted into the strength and the confidence. And that is something which I don't think I would have ever imagined at maybe a teenage into my early twenties that I was going to be able to alchemize the things that were holding me back and turn them into the things that are perpetuating me forward. Beautiful. Um, Helen, what would you say to your younger self? But can I ask can I ask Lloyd a quick question? Which of is course. as a dyslexic, how do you remember all the lines? Sorry? As a dyslexic and yeah. an actor, how do you remember all your streams and streams of lines? I find that so um fascinating. No, in my mind, I could, you know, those they, all those words would just get jumbled up. I can only rely on instinct. Yeah, well, you know what it is. I think it's a it's a it's a mixture of when you learn the lines, and I was like just learning the actual dialogue, and I was drawing the pictures for dialogue. That's just the line, and then it becomes it's about what's underneath the line. So if we're having a conversation, and it's simply like um, a very simple conversation, like hello, and the other person says hello. Underneath that hello, is it what kind of hello are we talking about? Is that hello? I know what you've been doing, or hello good to see you or hello i never want to see you again you know and it's, it's the feeling and the, and the thoughts and the emotion the, yeah and yeah. the the dialogue and then the paradox becomes that the lines and they are important of course but it's about what's the what's happening underneath everything rather than what you're actually saying so that's really what you're kind of remembering and then the lines uh, become secondary actually to that so it becomes a lot easier it's almost again about coming into this zone rather than learning it piecemeal, reading it through. Yeah, yeah, it becomes about. Um, yeah, you don't put so... the script under your pillow for osmosis. Finding your own way, isn't it? Sorry. Finding your own way to learn things. Like Charlotte, you said you can use movement sometimes to learn something, to remember something. So rather than just relying yeah. on um, the teacher telling you, you just have to learn something route you just have to find what works for you and how you can remember things your own your own mechanism isn't it yeah, yeah. that's it yeah, yeah. Your, key, your key to the zone and, and, and uh, understand what you're learning this little dyslexic bubble yeah. yeah yeah exactly understand what you're learning it and I, it actually it's uh yeah always i ask myself if i'm looking at a script is why am i saying that and then when i know why i'm saying it uh that is the sort of and the, the sort of thing that links together is like here's the line and here's why I'm saying it. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's, totally. Um, but for me, yeah, I think that's the whole thing about sex is we need reason. People see us as being slightly zany and a bit off the wall, but it's not. It's the opposite. When we're taught at school science in such a ridiculously linear fashion, nothing has any meaning. As soon as you start to have to understand stuff, be it a script or be it bit of physics or things like that and they, they have a reason then i think we can understand and process very well but we yes. just have such linear little boxy education system that it breaks down when we try to use it well, that's a good point yeah i uh i think that part of the em embodying the experiences uh abe i know that you can visualize as i and if i don't see everything through it at the same time i know that there is some sort of discord in it so part of uh, being able to embody that is how I kind of help myself control and dance and l almost turn the, 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 the knob on how much dyslexia do I want and how much do I want to spin versus try to regulate. Uh, and, and only with time and only with that experience 
that is, is kind of, you know, it's a tool. It's almost many lenses to dyslexia that we can bring in and out. And I think that would really surprise my younger self where I was so disoriented so many times. Now I just really love the ability to move with it. Um, Helen, what's some, what would surprise you when uh, you, you know, that you can do today that you thought you would never be able to do? Um, yeah, I think just the whole sort of trajectory things have taken would have surprised me because when I was younger, I just, um, I found writing so difficult. Uh, I still do, like, it's just, it just doesn't make sense to me to put things into words, which is not good to try to be academic. But, but um, I just, and I and I just thought when I, when I first found out I was dyslexic and kind of before that, I thought there was something really wrong with me. I thought I had some sort of brain damage. <laughs> and so then I think I'd be surprised that this thing I thought was this huge weakness has now become my kind of obsession. And it's coming back to what um, Abe and Lloyd were saying about this, asking why. It's because of always asking why that's got um, so the why can't I? Mm. Why can't I write? Why is it so hard that then I'm really good at figuring things out? Because that doesn't, why is this a disability? Because we have difficulty with sort of technology, by recent technology, that doesn't make sense. So then what is this way of thinking? It's just a different way of processing information. So why does that exist and what is that? And that's kind of what led to this new understanding. And, to understand the cognitive psychology and to understand what this way of thinking is and to understand why it exists. So, uh, yeah, I think, and, and I think the other thing that I wouldn't have envisaged is that um, it's just led me to meet so many amazing people as well, like uh, the King Kathy and all the people in this book. You meet so many nice people <laughs> working in this area. You meet so many cool people. So, uh, yeah, I think I would have been surprised they weren't taking me in all sorts of ways. But Helen, for you particularly, it must be really strange because you work in Cambridge amongst all these very scholarly, scholarly people who can write incredibly long words and I imagine incredibly fast words. And like, mm. Your process is so different. So how does it feel going, you know, working in, in parallel um, to, these, to the more traditional scholars than your more dyslexified scholarship? Um, I mean, that whole system feels very closed on me because dyslexic it's pretty much impossible to get very difficult to get funding because you're judged on how much you publish so i actually can only do my research by working and doing it alongside work so i have an affiliation there but i after your phd they don't take into account if you are dyslexic so to me and maybe james feels differently that the academic system is a bit yeah. cut off dyslexic so um yes yeah, so it's a very different way of way of working and uh, yeah <laughs> it's difficult <laughs> yeah, but very very but very worthy and, and <laughs> your writings are fantastic and your thoughts upon dyslexia and its role in the modern society is is so it, it's so enlightening for us fellow dyslexics to, to, to read and to start to see us being positioned as so as progressive not regressive yeah. absolutely James, what would surprise your younger self? Um, well, everything. Um, I mean, I think if I come back to, uh, uh, I, think, awesome. I think Kate, we're talking about Paul Smith um, saying major what we're good at, right? I did the exact opposite of that. Uh, I, I was, I suppose my real gift was that I had a vocation and I discovered that quite young. And that's really quite a significant advantage if you kind of got an idea of what you want to do because it meant that all the pain and suffering was contributing to me going in a direction and getting somewhere and getting to a goal. And I had a sense of where that goal was. So that was quite lucky. But I kind of figured out, I, I, I guess if you'd asked me when I was 16, I kind of thought that when I was 40 and I was a doctor that I would have it figured out. Like I would feel like an adult, like that I would understand there is a plan and I would be fully in control of it. And that each day I wouldn't wake up and go, oh, my God, you know, I, how am I going to get through these next series of problems? So I suppose that you can perceive that in one of two ways. I actually quite enjoy that. I enjoy the fact that every day I come into my working life and I think, oh, my God, what am I going to do today? Like, how, what am I going to achieve? What are the possibilities? Where can we go with this? How can we create? And I feel really very privileged to be able to do that. And the other thing that I suppose is surprising to me is that some of the things that I feared most at school and I was 
most insecure about in school, like mathematics, physics, science, biology, are some of the things that I enjoy most now and I take the most pleasure from. And I can find beauty and creativity and pleasure in visualizing complex data sets and mathematics that I'd never thought or imagined was really possible. And I find that really quite, um, quite enjoyable. And uh, you know, Helen was just talking about writing. Like writing was clearly a barrier for me that I had to overcome. When I was a kid, I'm really not a bad artist. I'm really quite a good portrait artist. And I, did, I kind of aced all my A-level art. And it was no good to me, right? Because I was going to go to bed. And, um, and I can see a lot of analogies now when I write in, as when I paint. Like when you paint, you kind of, it's like it becomes really obsessive. You paint, you paint, you paint, and you kind of focus on small components of that painting and then slowly you get this bigger picture in your head and you have to walk away from it. You have to come back to it. You have to keep maintain your perspective on it. And, I've, and I now really enjoy the creative process of writing, even like writing a scientific document. I can find some inherent, this is going to sound really ridiculous, like, so forgive me for sounding a bit poncy, but I can see there's beauty in it. There really is, right? And, uh, and I enjoy that. So when you turn, when your work becomes a creative process, no matter what it is, there's real joy in it. And I, and I suppose I'm surprised by that too. I kind of never figured that that would be the case. But when you have all your very complex data sheets and you're falling in love with the beauty, do you play with the graphical qualities of them? So does that, are you choosing fonts and, and circulating colors yes. and manipulating? Yeah, you're so right. I'm a designer. Totally obsessed so, yeah. over these sorts of of data. I can't yeah. I've really struggle to read spreadsheets. I have to have them graphically manipulated. Otherwise, I go to sleep. <laughs> And then, so like when I started my scientific career, like I found that I was pretty good at doing that, right? But most of my scientific colleagues just couldn't do that. They couldn't visualize what they were trying to say. They couldn't, they literally couldn't draw it out. But I could draw it out. I could take these kind of complex ideas, put them into a simple image with lots of pretty colors, and suddenly everything makes sense. So I found, I suppose the fact that an image speaks a thousand words to me was really my key to unlocking this whole thing because I could do that and then I could make sense of simple things. So to come back to like Lloyd was saying, he, when he's learning a script, he imagines the emotion of what's going on. I, I'm kind of the same. I try and visualize really what this means in real world terms. Like, uh, what, what does it look like? To me, that's important. If I can translate that, then it, then it means something. Yeah, I, um, I, I love that. I mean, you know, I think for dyslexic, a picture means a million words because there is no, it's a bottomless pit of words that we see things and feel things and uh, be able to embody that, be able to visualize that, be able to then connect the dots um, is something I think a lot of us do. And that's, uh, that's definitely a superpower. Uh, paper surprise, uh, your younger self. Oh yeah, I mean, go. I, I, I really struggled in school, as obviously most of us did, but I managed to get myself expelled from two schools. Um, so, yeah, my younger self would be surprised I'm, I'm, I'm anywhere in life, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I didn't really, I, I couldn't really read until I was about 11. And then, yeah, just, just struggled and that kind of, my teachers used to say I was naughty but nice, so I just was always in trouble, but I kind of did it with a smile. So they let me off, they let me off until I was so naughty they'd have to kick me out. Um, so yeah, I think my younger self would just be like, God, it's a miracle you're here. Um, I think for me, what sort of changed is I just learned how to learn in the way that made sense for me. Um, and funny enough, my dad was actually in the creative industries and my way of being a rebel is I did economics and maths at university, <laughs> and um, which is just very strange. But I was always actually really good at numbers, and I loved the patterns. And so yeah, I you know fast forward, and like I, I mean, no one even thought I'd finish GCSEs, let alone A levels. But yeah, I got a first, and it was like one of those magic moments. Except when I got a first, I emailed my dad to say I told you I was a genius, 
<laughs> I misspelled genius and I spelled it Guinness. <laughs> so I still. Is that how you spell genius? What's the difference? I think. Yeah, you know. I um, so my dad still has the email. He actually printed it out and it's in our toilet at home, which says I told you Guinness. Um, so yeah. But yeah, I think. I think for me, the breaking point was very much, I've been very open about my dyslexia. So if you email me on my email signature, it says delightfully dyslexic excuse typos. And as soon as I was open with it, it felt like I was able to ask for help or also people sort of understood why I was doing things a bit more. So yeah, I just, I think being open with it would have been the advice I should have given my younger self. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know, I, some of my clients get really bored of having to translate my, my mail. So I have two forms of communication, one which is done by my writer, which is perfect, which I use yeah. for some clients, and one which is me, which is this slightly mishmash, half, you know, non, I, if it's complimentary, but someone might say it's poetic, otherwise just say it's illiterate. And it's that funny maze that you, you end up playing in between these, these, these different worlds. Yeah, the weird, the funniest thing is... One of my best mates at uni was an English lit student and she said the best thing to me ever, which was just write like you talk. And so I'm the weirdo that sits at my computer talking to myself while I'm writing. So I just because that's helped me write in a weird way. So. But I wonder how many people across there were kicked out of school along 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 the way of the mission to uh to being a perfect dyslexia. Me certainly also three schools, two O levels. And, uh, which is before the GCSEs, no A level. I even failed pottery twice, which, and I'm quite a good potter these days. Um, and an MA much later. But you know, I think we take this very different journey, which I think has its its uh, its, its pluses. But I think it, it, that, that sorry to drop. I think there's two things. I think for me, the trigger was being told I couldn't do something. As soon as someone said to me, "You can't do this," I was like, "Well, okay, let's yeah. see what's right about that." Uh, Bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. I'm going to prove you wrong. And that was really motivating for me. And the other piece of advice I would give myself is like, don't be frightened. Don't be frightened of failure. Like, failure is only a problem if you don't learn from it and you don't sort of take the lessons. And I put your spot on. Like, I had exactly the same experience. I failed chemistry A level or something and I had to redo it. And for me, that unlocked everything. That was the moment I was like, okay, I need to learn how to learn from me. I left school. I went and worked out how, how my brain worked. And if I hadn't have done that, I, I wouldn't have got through med school. I honestly wouldn't be here now. So and I just don't don't be frightened of it. If, if you don't try, you can't. You know, you, you're not. If you're not failing. I, I, it, think, I think the importance of failure is super. You know, all my early designs used to collapse. Things would explode. They would break off. They would. They would. Luckily, no one ever got hurt. But you know, it was it was a, it was a route of, 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 of discovery. You know, you couldn't stop until you'd pulled it so hard or tensed it so much that it exploded, and then you knew you'd gone too too far. Now, luckily, any clients out there, our things don't break and explode. But we had to go through that experimental period. Yeah, and funny enough, I think that's maybe one of the reasons so many entrepreneurs are dyslexic because you know entrepreneurship is basically about failing, failing fast, and learning from the mistakes and moving on. Yes. So, like you know. Every successful entrepreneur I know is, is the one that can persevere through the highs and lows, can get through the failures. And I guess that's why, you know, 40% of self-made millionaires are hard and flexible because we kind of had to learn failure, perseverance, all these kind of wonderful traits that, that kind of make us great dyslexic leaders and um, entrepreneurs. I think really Absolutely. Good. Go ahead. And I just think you're really good at finding way. You always sort of, there's always a way through. You always figure out a way to sort of get through. So, I mean, I don't fit into academia at all, but I, I will get my research out there and I will continue doing this because you'll just you'll just keep problem solving and find different ways of doing it. Yeah. So I think that's one thing about people with dyslexia tend to be quite tenacious. And quite yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Perseverance and tenacity. Yes. Yeah. Well out. Can I can I ask can I ask as well if, if any if anyone else um, if I if I this is all about positivity of course but there's one thing I'm not sure if everyone else shares a common thing or if it's just human nature or if this this is uh, a dyslexic trait is the overthinking of things. Yeah. Do we have all the overthinking? hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, just to jump in there, like. I think always being critiqued at school and always preparing for 
like a red fail stamp on your work. It almost, um, I almost feel like I overthink an email. It's so silly. It's so silly, yeah. isn't it? And I constantly, I'm, I'm, I'm prepared for whoever's going to respond to come back with like red pen all over it. So I overthink, I'll go into so much detail about, I don't know if I actually, I, th I think if, do you mean overthink everything in terms of attention to detail or just, um, just generally overthinking? Worry. Worry, because <laughs> I just jumped in on worries then. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean, I, I definitely, actually it covers, overthinking just covers a lot of it. Yeah, you're, you're over, if you're worrying about something, you're overthinking about that worry. If the thing that's not even to think twice about, you're still oh, you're still thinking about that thing. Or I'm just wondering because as a dyslexic, I feel like the people that I know, um, uh, to Jill as well about he does a lot of meditation and and so do I. And the, probably the reason for that is is because we live a very, I live very much in my head, so I have to come into my body i have to come into my heart almost you know live there that's right because up here is you get in that world of that is just a kind of an habitual way of thinking by overthinking things so i just yeah. wondered if that was like a, a through line through through us. Can and, and, and does anyone have anything that they use to to kind of uh dim that down or or what, what are their experiences through that to try to try and not be such a person who overthinks. So yeah, I mean, for me, for me to, to your question about that is that it's about thinking big. And if we embrace it, then the overseeing details is part of the gift, is we're able to then see all the nuance at the same time. And if we fight it, then it can be uncontrollably overwhelming. But I think that the gift of the dyslexia mind is that in the blink of a second, I can see a thousand pieces of detail and I can kind of feel when they connect and when they don't. Mm -hmm. When I used to fight that, then it's a discord because you're just spinning and you're not realizing what your mind is doing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, thinking big, uh, is that something that you guys sort of play with? Is that something that you sort of embrace in that way? I see Pippi, you're shaking your head, yeah? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's so interesting because there's this wonderful piece of research, I think it's Harvard, but it says that we have wider peripheral vision. And so we're taking in more data all the time. And what I find really fascinating about that and working in tech is, you know, like we're all talking about the robots and the robots are coming. But, you know, humans are the most sophisticated robots that exist. We take in all this data and we synthesize it into creative thought and intuition and gut feeling. And running a tech company and seeing like those outer edges and the big picture is amazing because I can spot things that no one else does and I can see patterns and bring it into it. And so, yeah, I, I, I love it. It can be completely overwhelming. And then I take myself, I, I'm a massive sleeper. So the way I cope with it is I, I sleep like about 10 hours a night because oh it's almost like that's so my processing time. Like I've taken in too much data. So I need to process, and then if I have that much sleep, I'm great. If I don't, I'm almost over over process. I've got too much data to deal with. <laughs> that makes sense. I, I find that I have a sort of like, different problem, which is that um, I kind of really feel what you're saying, Lloyd. I definitely get that, but I feel like my brain is permanently switched on and is permanently churning out idea after idea after idea. Like it's just never stopping. And my problem is is that uh, they're all amazing, right? <laughs> but like this one's going to cure cancer. We've got to do this one, and then and then picking picking the winner and and really, my challenge is focusing. It's like okay, I'm going to devote a real chunk of time, and I'm going to make sure that one delivers, and I'm really going to put it out. So my solution really is to try and find enablers, people who kind of get me that I don't have to be ashamed or embarrassed about you know, being myself around, who understand that this is just how my brain works. And they can sit me down and go, James, not that one, not that one, this one. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just help you by perhaps giving you some of the skills that maybe you're not quite so good at to try and really deliver deliver this so that it, that it works. And so when I go, I just don't sleep. <laughs> I just lie awake and it drives me nuts. <laughs>
<laughs> now that becomes about a dyslexic partnership. And I was going to say, I'm not sure about always thinking big, but I think really fast and I think obsessively and I think, as you say, all the time. And I have to occasionally have a joint just to stop. Otherwise, it all gets a little bit too far. And I, you know, I need to slow down and, and then you take a more of a, an objective overview. But the counterpoint is sometimes it's quite hard to keep that real concentration. And in a way, as I've got older, my concentration has slightly got worse. But you build teams up around you, as you say, to, to kind of counter position it, which, which is to, to, to create kind of counterbalancing. So you can process it through. So you can throw out your ideas really, really quickly. And if I do a short talk, I just, I talk pretty quickly. And if I do a longer talk, I talk slower. But you can, you can, um, you know, change gears and move through this, this, this system. But, so, and I'm not big, but it's certainly fast. And just to follow but please, I don't do a lot of that. And I'd be really interested to hear Charlotte's view on this. Like, so for me, why I like surgery is because when I operate, I can only do one thing. And everything else stops, and my brain stops, and I only think about that one task that I'm doing, and it's almost hypnotic. And you're just in the movement, and it's, it is like a choreography. And when you're doing that one task, it has to have your complete concentration, and it's almost a relief. It's like four to six hours of just relief and, and then you leave and then you go back into the craziness and i kind of i think so you're dancing I think it's, pot, I guess it must be. Pot, it's, it's the same yeah it's true but from when my pots fail no one dies that's why i'm more nervous about surgery do you listen to music <laughs> or in my surgery oh. i listen to music uh, so i do listen to music and well it depends what i'm doing it depends how much concentration I really need. If I'm really, really, really have to focus, no. But I often use it as a way to to get to break down barriers and talk to my team. So if I don't know the people I'm working with, I make them put on the music so that we then have something to talk about and to communicate with, and that we have something in common. And then you find out a bit about who they are and what they like, and then it sort of just breaks down those barriers. So it can be quite useful in that sense. Um, and also, sometimes when you're trying to just get the tone, it can really help. So you want people relaxed but focused, right? So you've got to pick your tunes quite well. And then, of yeah. course, you know, there's a bit of rivalry about that. Mm. Yeah, you can't pick something too upbeat in case, <laughs> in case you start dancing around the operating room. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely going to be quite half with those. Yeah. Does... Um does you know one things that I, I i as we started today and we started to sort of get to the uh, top of the hour here is that we asked ourselves what would we uh surprise our younger self maybe as we sort of get to start to kind of wrap up is to, to ask uh you know what would your older self uh what kind of advice your older self will give you today so if you can sort of put yourself into you know your nine-year-old self and they would look back at you what would they uh what, what kind of guidance would they give you helen do you want to start um okay um i think my 90 year old self would i like to think they'd tell me not to not to give up and um yeah and just to find a different way forward perhaps it's good not to always try and fit into how things are done if that's not working for you and uh but Helen, yeah. you'll never give up. You know that yourself. Say again. You'll never give up. You know that yourself. That's so true. You yeah. don't need your older self advice. Say again. So you don't really need your older self advice because you're so committed to the cause, knowing you better than uh, that. I feel that you will, you will, you will pioneer and continue to push your boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. You have days when you have a wobble and you think, "What am I doing?" <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, when I think about the actual research and I think about what the ideas are and, and I see all the evidence and I, I just think I can't, I can't give it up. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lloyd, what would, uh, what would you recommend? What would your older self, what kind of advice would it give you? Um, I think if I could really take this in at this age, it would be quite remarkable, but it was certainly something I would do with my children when I do have children. It would be to find fulfillment in just yourself, in who you are. Mm. Because you're going to have things that you love doing. You're going to, like, for instance, you know, music or acting, whatever it is. But, you, but that's, all, that's just a part of who you are. It's an amazing part of who you are, but it's just a part of who you are. So my advice would be to find the fulfillment in just you, just being you. Because 
so much in life is about trying to be something else other than what we are. Or we're trying to, especially as a young person, especially in society today, you know, you see it so much. It's like no one's really happy with being them. And so it's like, like if you could drill that into a nine-year-old, how much worth and how much value they have as a person of just who they are, then everything else that life brings you would feel like more of a kind of bonus, more of a kind of, you know, really be in that kind of abundant flow of it and, and understand it for what it was mm. rather than, you know, trying to chase something that maybe you already, you already fulfilled and everything else is more about like a, it's a goal or a quest rather than like life or death. It's just you can enjoy the journey more. Yeah. Beautiful. That was really moving. Charlotte, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, my older self would say, like, keep discovering, keep exploring, um, and set your own expectations. Like, I think whether it's looking back at school and only be being able to write a paragraph and staring at the page for 40 minutes, you know, whether it's then a whole page, like setting yourself those stepping stones and knowing what your expectations are and not letting other people tell you that. So I think um, that makes everything feel more achievable and more manageable. And I feel like if you apply that, then you can keep going on that trajectory and kind of achieve the things you want to achieve. So I'd say, yeah, keep exploring and kind of go at your own pace. Beautiful. Yeah. Pip, what advice would you give yourself? Oh, um, yeah, I would definitely say probably celebrate the wins more. Um, I think Part of my challenge is that I'm always going on to the next thing and the next thing and I'm not, so I don't stop and sit back, you know, I, I work six days a week, 15 hour days and so I basically work and then sleep and so I, yeah, I'd say just sometimes I need to get better at smelling the roses and going, this is great and celebrating it as opposed to just continually pushing myself, which is definitely the, uh, positive of my my dyslexia but also can be the negative of my dyslexia as well yeah i can very much relate to that as well everything mm -hmm. is moved so fast and it's like you know you're kind of feeding it you know part of uh, part of dyslexia is we try to regulate it but if we just sort of feed it and i think that's when we're looking into sort of solving problems everywhere they are and it's never ending um james what would, what advice would you give your uh, yourself uh, well, it's kind of hard to follow because the advice you've just heard is so good. I think Lloyd pretty much nailed it. Um, <laughs> I think if I, if I was going to say one thing, it would be never be frightened to ask a question. Right? So many, for so many years, I sat in the back of the classrooms and lecture halls and I was thinking, I just don't get this, but I'm worried that if I, if I ask, I'm going to look stupid. And now what I do when I'm teaching or if I'm in a class or I'm in a lecture theatre, I'm always the first one to ask a question because I know that if I ask that question and it's really silly, everyone else will be relaxed enough to ask what's really on their mind. And invariably, when you ask that question, most people in the room didn't know the answer anyway. And right. just it, I think you should never, ever be frightened to learn. Never feel that you don't have the right to learn or that you can't learn. You absolutely can. You just need, as I think Charlotte said at the beginning, you just need to find your own way of doing it. And it's there, but just don't give up on trying to find it. Because once you find it, you just unlock everything. You'll, un you'll unlock Peter to a long and, and happy and interesting career and in whatever it is that you choose to do. The questions are so much more interesting than answers. Mm. Fair. Absolutely. Abe, what, would, what, what advice would you give? Uh, you know, what, what advice your older self will give you? I think slow down and maybe be a little bit less hedonistic at times. Mm. <laughs> I feel there's some stories there, Abe, and I want to hear them. <laughs> I think we all have stories, isn't it? <laughs> well, one of the things we say often uh, as we do our work is that you have to slow down to move fast. And I think that's something that uh, we found as dyslexic is that if we can slow down because we think so fast by just just slowing down, we can compress a lot of thought into a small amount of time, but it does take for us to sort of kind of take a deep breath and bring it down a notch so we can see even more of the bigger picture and almost be inside of this suspension of times and idea and be able to see how it all connects, you know? Um, we keep talking about these zones and bubbles, I think. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you, do you I, have, a, have anything that you do to slow down? Is there anything that you, that you uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a moment that you need to slow down or just as a lifestyle? Is there anything that you... Because I think, I think my, processing, my processing works a bit too fast at times. It leaves people behind and it, gets, it becomes difficult to, you know, the communication can... My partner, who's very rigid and brilliant, not rigid, but he's very methodological. And, all, and my life partner, similarly, and they, they get driven mad slightly by the way that I'm speeding ahead and always have conclusions before the, the question has been asked necessarily. And often I'm, it's not always right. So it's, that, it's uh, trying to slow down, I think, generally. Mm -hmm. To think okay. slow. As a person, yeah. I understand. Yeah, the way I've managed it is obviously sleeping a lot, but I actually, Sunday's my sacred day. So I put my phone on airplane mode and I go to a wood and I plant trees. <laughs> but that's my kind of like, I, I have to have one day a week where I do nothing. And that's why like that's I good. Keep I need that. But for me, as I, as I said before, it's this thing of doing pottery. I sit on the wheel and time gets suspended. And it's a very different place. But I think we're all talking about the same thing. There are ways to get into the zone, whether it's dancing or surgery, which I find them more perverse, or acting or scholarliness or inventing robots. It's this zone that we try to, to create or building great brand strategy or writing extraordinary books, but we just ourselves. And then that's when things can slow down. And I cook it when I cook, I slow down actually. But, but I think well, I, just to follow on, I'm just sort of listening to you all talk. I think that when you're um, a dyslexic person, you don't have to be one person. Like I don't think of myself as a surgeon at all. Like I, I feel like I'm privileged and lucky enough to be able to do lots of different things, and it took me a long time to feel comfortable in that and to be confident to talk to other people about it. Like to 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 carve out your own position in the world based on the content that you have. And I think that maybe that would also be another piece of advice. I think. Actually, can I ask a question as well? Has anyone got any other neurodiversity parts of them? Because obviously, a lot of time neurodiversity interlinks. So. You know, I'm, I'm I'm slightly ADHD. My brother's dyslexic and autistic. So, does anyone else have any other neuro traits? No. Yeah, I'm sure I have other traits, but I'm generally just dys dyslexic. Is what I is what I the brand I go with, or, or you know, you know, the first. I definitely have a few of the others. I'm sure it's all part of the spectrum, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like this, you know, the circles interlocking, and so yeah, it's interesting because. Whenever I talk to, you know, we're definitely not all the same, but sometimes the interlocking circles also have their own different crazinesses and wonderfulnesses as well. So I was just wondering if anyone else does. So, like, you know, it's yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's like multi colored. No, it's interesting for me because I'm with my ADHD, I get hyper focused. So I don't, yeah. have, I don't get unfocused. I get hyper focused, which is bad as well. Not bad, but it's great for work. But it can be just that's all I do. So I just mm, that's interesting. I get the opposite. Yeah, I, I want some of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Einstein was dyslexic, autistic, and ADHD. So I think those three are the that is the like golden. <laughs> but there's no such thing as this normal. Oh, everyone's got no. a bit of something somewhere. Yeah. They're just too. Too stiff to admit it. You've got to search it out. I'm always accusing my brilliant business partner of being autistic, or in a very, in a very positive way, mm -hmm. in his, in his hyper focusedness and his complete. But um, that's what we love about Helen's theory: is saying that society needs everyone. We need um, to be dyslexic, we need people who are really fine detail and you need everybody in between and nobody's better than anybody else we need everybody in society and it's just the trouble that school at the moment is favoring a certain type of personality so um yeah <laughs> i to say that but helen's theory is so beautiful um everyone needs to learn to be sure about it well, I think what we particularly need is a, is a big book on dyslexic great people. Obviously, title pronounced wrongly in the wrong order, but and we need you two. I think you two bring us all together. So buy it now, while it's still hot off the press. Well, everybody, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much for being here and uh, sharing this uh all your thoughts and perspective. I'm sure we can keep talking for hours and hours. And because hours, of that, hours. hours and hours and hours, but because of that, we are um, having more of these salons coming up. 
Our next uh, salon is going to be next week on October 15th at uh, 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Uh, UK. And we're going to be talking to uh, an inventor and marketing and how do we uh, reinvent categories and how do we bring that uh, to life on, uh, on a global scale. And, um, you know, many more to come thereafter. So please stay tuned, subscribe, uh, add some questions in the chat so we can use it for our next uh, events. And, uh, uh, you know, just would love to hear more from everybody. So. Ken, Kathy, thank you so much for the book. Thank you so much for bringing all thank of us together. Best. I mean, we're so, so grateful shedding the beautiful light on the dyslexia community around the world. And uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, be well. Go thank ahead. You, Bill. Thank you, Kate. So great to hear all your advice. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>